Welcome everybody to the sixth meeting of the ZOA Book Club. Uh, we're very, very honored today to have uh, an expert on Islam and in, in, in the Middle East uh, who's written several books. Uh, Robert Spencer is our featured author. I have a couple of his books right here. Um, and uh, he's written this wonderful book on the Palestinian delusion. Uh, the Catastrophic History of Middle East Peace. And I'm going to quickly read you what Morton Klein, the head of ZOA, said about Robert Spencer's new book, The Palestinian Delusion. Um, if you want to learn, uh, if this is Mort, Mort Klein, if you want to learn the whole unknown hidden truth of the Arab Islamic war against Israel, read this book from cover to cover. Robert Spencer's book teaches you how to answer virtually every propaganda lie about Israel and Arabs when it's confronted with by Israel haters, Jew haters, and those simply ignorant of the facts. This comprehensive treatise will eliminate the ability of newspapers and TV and radio and social media to convince you of their Mideast distortions and falsehoods, a critically necessary work in this Orwellian era. Um, I might add that it's you know, very readable, very, you know, very, very well done. Um, important details, uh, just, you know, it just it shows the whole scope of history and, and what really happened. Um, I would strongly recommend it if somebody needs one book to read uh, about uh, Israel and the Middle East, um, read this book. Um, it's, it's up there with uh, groundbreaking book, books such as uh, Battleground and, uh, you know, and a while, while back, uh, Menachem Begin's The Revolt. A um, very, very important book. And I would now like to turn this over to our featured guest, uh, Robert Spencer. Thank you so much, Liz. And it's a great honor to be here. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I am going to actually hold up the book in question right now. I was trying to send one to Liz, but apparently they all have coronavirus and they wouldn't send. So I read it online. I read it online. <laughs> One that is uh, coronavirus free, and I believe that they are actually coronavirus free in general. Uh, the post its are extra. But the uh, Palestinian delusion, the catastrophic history of the Middle East peace process, is just that a history of how various powers, notably the United States, but not limited thereto, have attempted to bring peace between Israel and the Muslim Arabs, the, known as the Palestinians today. The uh, primary point of the book, if you read through the entire history of the Middle East peace process, is that the whole thing has been wrongheaded from the start. And so in order to underline that point, I thought that it would be useful to begin with the controversy that is raging right now over what is known as annexation, which of course is a misnomer in itself because the Israelis don't need to annex land that already belongs to Israel. And that is the situation that we face today. We hear a great deal, of course, about the occupied territories. And I'm sure that uh, very many of you are well aware that there are no actual occupied territories because the land of Israel, uh, there is no other country, I should say, that owns this territory, including the so-called occupied territories, other than Israel. So who are they occupying it from? Who actually owns it? These questions are never asked or answered in the establishment media, because if they were, they would lead us right back to the fact that Israel has the only legitimate claim to that land. In the book, I detail why that is, notably because at the time of the fall of the Ottoman Empire, the Ottomans actually ceded the land, uh, that's C-E-D-E-D, -E -E that is, they relinquished control legally to, of that land to the League of Nations, the precursor to the United Nations. And the League of Nations, of course, awarded it to Britain for the purpose, the express purpose, of fulfilling the Balfour Declaration in the mandate for Palestine and establishing a Jewish national home. The territory in question included what is today Israel, as well as what are known as the what is known as the West Bank or Judea and Samaria, and the country of Jordan, as well as Gaza. Now, 
Jordan was detached fairly quickly from the mandate by the British because uh, notably Lawrence of Arabia, the famous, uh, not Peter O'Toole, but the real Lawrence of Arabia, Arabia who fought in World War I, uh, he made the, a strong case, he and others made a strong case that the British owed a debt to the Arabs because the Arabs had aided them against the Ottoman Turks during World War I. Now, this case was overstated in the first place. The Arabs really had not given any significant help to the British during World War I, but nonetheless, because of this, they were immediately given three quarters of the mandate for Palestine for an Arab state, even though there were many other Arab states in the area, just as there are now. And so the country of Jordan was actually originally set aside for as part of the Jewish national home. Now, once, of course, the Zionist project led to large scale Jewish immigration into the area, which, as I note in the book, was not some sort of new uh, presence of Jewish people in the land in question, because there had always been a Jewish presence in what is known as Palestine, ever since the Romans renamed it Palestine in the second century, in order to uh, punish the Jews, they went and found a uh, name from the Bible of the Jews' ancient enemies, the Philistines, and called the place after them. But this was always the name of a region, not the name of the people. And there were always Jewish people in the area, but the uh, Jewish population began to increase significantly, of course, when uh, Zionism took off in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. And then what is uh, probably the most notable event that is completely overlooked at this time is that it was the British who encouraged the Arabs to undertake terrorist attacks in order to discourage Zionist settlement in the area. Now that is a very uh, serious charge. And so in order to back it up, I'll give you the exact quote. This is uh, the British colonel, the financial advisor to the military administration in Palestine, Colonel Bertie Harry Waters Taylor, a uh, very British name. And he spoke to Haj Amin al-Husseini, who was of course the Mufti of Jerusalem, uh, later became a collaborator with Hitler during World War II. But uh, Colonel Bertie Harry Waters Taylor told him in 1920 that he, quote, had a great opportunity at Easter, this was just before Easter 1920, to show the world that Zionism was unpopular not only with the Palestine administration, but in Whitehall, that is among the British Foreign Service. And if disturbances of sufficient violence, disturbances of sufficient violence occurred in Jerusalem at Easter, both General Bowles, who was the chief administrator in Palestine for the British at that time, and General Allenby, who was the British commander of the Egyptian force, and then the high commissioner of Egypt, would advocate the abandonment of the Jewish home. So Colonel Waters Taylor is actually telling the Mufti of Jerusalem that if the Arabs carried out terrorist attacks, that they would be able to compel the British to abandon altogether the idea of a Jewish national home in Palestine. Of course, the Arabs did take up the idea of terrorist attacks and they uh, did their best to turn the British away from the project. The British did approach it with great reluctance and quite gingerly for quite some time after that. Uh, but ultimately, the Jewish state was able to be founded primarily uh, as a result of the support of the United States President Truman. And this is, of course, skipping up to 1948. Uh, Truman had departed from his predecessor, Franklin Roosevelt's policy. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt actually counseled bowing to violent intimidation when some Jewish leaders came to him and asked him for support for a Jewish national home. He said, and I quote, are you trying to start a holy jihad? Now, that demonstrates that he knew something that modern politicians routinely deny, and that is 
that there is a religious imperative to the war against Israel, that the Palestinians so-called are not just fighting for land, but are fighting because of something that stems from the, the Islamic religion itself, and that is the principle of jihad, uh, particularly based on the idea that is encapsulated in chapter two, verse 190 of the Quran, which says, drive them out from where they drove you out. Now, this is an important point when we come to 1948, because of course, a, n another staple of the uh, idea of that, the idea that Israel occupies territory and that this annexation would be a terrible outrage against that, uh, is that the Israelis drove the, uh, the Palestinian Arabs out of the area. Now, in reality, this is not the case. As I'm sure many of you are well aware, the, uh, Arab, the Arab Higher Committee, the Arab League, actually told the Arabs of the uh, lands of Israel, the land that was becoming the state of Israel, to leave the area because they thought in 1948 that there would be a quick war at the time that the Saudis and the Lebanese and the Jordanians and the Syrians and the Egyptians had declared war against Israel, the new state of Israel, they figured they would be uh, driven out very quickly and that that would be the end of the story and then they could come back home. They did not, of course, that, it, the situation did not work out that way. They did not win the war. And so they weren't able to go back. And so the myth grew that they had been driven out. But this is a very carefully chosen myth, you see, because the idea is that if they make the case that they were driven out, even though it is not historically accurate, then the Quranic imperative kicks in that they must, they have a responsibility before Allah that is not any more negotiable than the Ten Commandments are. They have a responsibility before Allah to drive out those who drove them out. And so this also has become a cornerstone of the Palestinian case because on it depends the whole impetus for the war against Israel. There is no war against Israel if you can have a negotiated peaceful settlement. But one of the main, one of the most outstanding examples of the myopia of Western leaders ever since the founding of the State of Israel, and before that as well, is that a negotiated settlement is possible because this is really a dispute over land, and so we can ultimately find some compromise solution that will give everyone a little bit of the land and everything will be okay. Actually, the Palestinian jihad imperative is maximalist. Drive them out from where they drove you out doesn't say drive them out from part of where they where they drove you out or a little bit of where they drove you out or drive them out and then they'll make you can make an agreement with them to coexist in the rest of the land. It's absolutely total. It has to the 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 state of Israel has to be completely destroyed. So one of the primary mistakes you see that American presidents have made ever since the beginning is to say this is something that we can make an agreement about at all. There's no making an agreement about a, an Islamic religious imperative. They're not gonna negotiate away the religion that they believe that they have to protect and defend. Also, of course, the invention of the Palestinians themselves is one of the primary cornerstones of this idea that there is a distinct Palestinian people who own this land. And so, the whole scenario begins to come together, that you have a Palestinian people, they are the legitimate owners of the land, and they were driven out by the Israelis. The British illegitimately gave them to the, uh, gave the land to the Israelis. The Israelis illegitimately occupy it, and so the Israelis ought to withdraw in the, uh, if they had any interest in justice and fairness and peace. So we've already seen that there was no occupation because there was no, uh, the, the, the state, the land was given to Israel, not anybody else. And also there's no people from whom it was occupied because there are no Palestinians. The Palestinians, it's noteworthy when I was re uh, researching this book and 
reading the uh, material from 1948 and before, it's noteworthy that there's not a single mention of Palestinians. All the time in 1948, 1947, the time when the Jewish state is being founded, the time when the de de Declaration of Independence is issued, the time when the uh, uh, Arab countries go to war against the new Jewish state, nobody ever says the Palestinians are the ones who are the rightful owners of this land. Nobody even mentions Palestinians, not even in the Arab literature. Is there ever a single, not even one, mention of this Palestinian people that so preoccupies the United Nations and the international media today? Nary a single mention. And this is because they did not come to exist until the 1960s and they were invented as a propaganda weapon against Israel. Because for Israel, the optics were very favorable in the 1960s. And you may recall, if you were as old as I am, that uh, in the 1960s, the situation in the United States was very different. And you didn't have this kind of open anti-Semitism on campuses or in the media, uh, let alone from two Congresswomen. Uh, it, there was great support for Israel in the United States that has eroded significantly. And I think one of the reasons why, in the first place, there was the great support then is because Americans love an underdog. And you have the tiny Jewish state standing up, defending its very right to exist against 22 giant Arab states that are inveterately hostile to it, and all the other Muslim non-Arab states that are also hostile to it. And they stand firm, and they beat them in war after war, and they defend themselves in these wars of aggression, that is, aggression against them. And it was something that made the Israelis extraordinarily popular in the United States. So the KGB, because this is of course during the time of the Cold War, and Yasser Arafat devised in the 1960s a way to counter this as a rhetorical matter. And that was by creating an even smaller people that would be menaced by the massive Israeli defense war machine. And consequently, the uh, Palestinian people were invented. And suddenly, this mythology became uh, widely accepted that the Palestinian people were the rightful owners of the land, that there was a distinct ethnicity and nationality uh, of a Palestinian people as opposed to, for example, uh, the Lebanese or the Syrians or the Jordanians. In reality, there's no ethnic, linguistic, religious, cultural difference between the Arabs of Palestine and the Arabs of Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, uh, and, uh, well, to a lesser degree, Egypt. Egypt is a bit different, but it's also different from the others. In any case, the Palestinian people then, being invented, they become the rightful owners of the territory. It becomes occupied by Israel, and thus it, it becomes the Israelis presence there becomes an illegitimate thing or at very least a temporary thing that eventually is going to be resolved in the favor of the Palestinians. And so it was an extraordinarily uh, effective rhetorical trick or propaganda trick to invent this people. But it never would have succeeded had it not been uncritically accepted by the international media and also accepted ultimately by the United States and by the Israelis themselves. Now, that happened to a tremendous degree because of Jimmy Carter. And uh, in the book, I detail the sorry history of the Camp David Accords. Uh, people don't know a lot of the background about them. I mean, I know that when I was last in Jerusalem and I was walking, I passed by the Begin Sadat Center. And I know that Sadat, the president of Egypt, is a revered figure among many in Israel uh, because he's considered to be a great peacemaker. In the book, I show that uh, the reality is a bit different. Sadat uh, attempted to make peace with the Israelis because he was pushed into a corner and he had to do it. Uh, and he decided to try to gain by peaceful means what he could not gain by violent means. What happened was uh, Leonid Brezhnev, the premier of the Soviet Union, uh, 
was, uh, I, I have a great quote from Brezhnev in the book when Gromyko during a Politburo meeting asks him, what are we gonna do about uh, the Egyptians and uh, Israel? And, the, uh, and Brezhnev says, we're going to restore diplomatic relations with Israel, which was an extraordinarily uh, uh, bold thing to say. And he says, on our, on, our own on our own initiative, yes, that's right. And Gromyko says, yes, uh, but the Arabs are going to upset. They'll make a fuss. This is right after the 1973 war. And Brezhnev says about the Arabs, they can go to hell. We've offered them a sensible way for so many years. But no, they wanted to fight. Fine. We gave them technology, the latest, the kind even Vietnam didn't have. They had double superiority in tanks and aircraft triple in artillery and in air defense and anti-tank weapons, they had absolute supremacy. And what? Once again, they were beaten. Once again, they scrammed. Once again, they screamed for us to come save them. Sadat, the great peacemaker, wrote. Sadat woke me up in the middle of the night twice over the phone. Save me, he demanded, to send Soviet troops. And immediately, no, we're not going to fight for them. The people would not understand that. And especially, we will not start a world war because of that. So that's that. We will act like I said. So that's Brezhnev. And that being the case, Sadat was cornered. He couldn't start another war. And so he realized that he was going to have to make peace with Israel. And since Israel was allied with the United States, he could get a better deal by manipulating the United States than by remaining allied with the Soviet Union. And so that's why he suddenly became an ally of the United States and was welcomed as a liberator, uh, as, sorry, as a peacemaker in, in, uh, when he offered to go to Jerusalem and was welcomed to Camp David to make peace with Menachem Begin. But he was completely self-serving. What he was trying to do was gain everything that he could not gain militarily. And he had tremendous help in that from Carter. Uh, Carter actually told him, uh, he referred to him as my wonderful friend. Now note, by contrast, he told Rosalind, his wife, that Mah Menachem Begin was a psycho. But he said that uh, Sadat, this is Carter, was a great and good man and my wonderful friend. And he told Sadat, I will represent your interests as if they were my own. You are my brother. Now, meanwhile, Sadat is laughing up his sleeve at all this, and he's telling his uh, advisors who he brought to Camp David with him about his conversation with Carter after this, and he refers to Carter as poor, naive Carter. But he took full advantage, and uh, Begin went back and said to his own entourage that the Americans have adopted the Egyptians' position entirely. And so that was one of the first instances where uh, Israel had to give up territorial gains that were perfectly legitimate because they were won against an aggressor in an aggressive war, and that is particularly the Sinai, in exchange for promises, in exchange for a peace that has not kept the Egyptians from inciting hatred against Israel or allowing the Islamic State, ISIS, to gain a foothold in Sinai, uh, allowing Hamas to gain, to get supplies and weapons through the Sinai to Gaza and so on and so on and so on. It's, uh, it's only a peace in the sense that Egypt doesn't attack Israel outright because they're getting paid by the United States. So <clears throat> the uh, Palestinians at Camp David got the legitimacy of the United States. They, the Egyptians put in the speaking uh, language about the Palestinian people in the Camp David Accords. And Carter brought it to Begin. And Begin said, no, we'll, we'll accept language about Arabs, but not about the Palestinian people who do not exist. And Carter got impatient and exasperated and insisted that Begin had to uh, accept the Palestinian people. He did not do it uh, freely. He did not do it because he thought that uh, this was a good way to proceed. He did it because he was essentially cornered. And he had to. But this has become a uh, strategic error that has been exploited again and again and again by the Palestinians with, of course, the willing aid of the international media and the uh, 
United Nations. Now, there's a great deal more that could be said about all this, but I want to uh, go on to the questions. I'll just conclude by saying that President Trump is the first to change this even to some small extent, uh, primarily by, in the first place, not taking all the Palestinian claims at face value, but uh, actually calling them on their hypocrisy, calling them on their support for terrorism when they claim to be in, uh, supporting initiatives for peace, cutting off their money as a result of their refusal to stop supporting terrorism, and above all, moving the embassy to Jerusalem despite all sorts of threats of terrorism. In the first for the first time in many years, uh, putting the United States in the position of not bowing to the violent intimidation that the Palestinians have been using for decades to get their way. And uh, his peace plan seems inconsistent with all that, just in the fact that it exists and is a peace plan, a negotiated, <clears throat> excuse me, an offer for a negotiated settlement with a people who will, <coughs> excuse me, who will never accept a negotiated settlement. But the reality is that it is, I think, a very canny move to uh, manipulate world opinion, to change world opinion back to a more sane footing. Right now you have tremendous sympathy for the Palestinian Arabs in the uh, international media, in Washington, in uh, the State Department, everywhere. The onus is on Israel to prove that they're in favor of peace and everybody takes for granted that the Palestinians are, as absurd as that is. <clears throat> and so Trump has now given them this extraordinarily favorable offer that would give them a state and all sorts of other things they've been demanding, and they don't want it. $50 billion, more than anybody's ever gotten in a package like this, and they don't want it. And so now it's very clear who the obstacle to peace is. And so I think that was actually one of the foremost aspects of the plan. And uh, in any case, we'll see how that shakes out. But uh, the recommendation that I make at the end of this book is that we abandon this peace process altogether and put the whole thing on a more realistic footing. Uh, if the Israeli government and the United States government, for example, did not uh, put the, uh, did not recognize the existence of the Palestinians, they could be in a much better position to put pressure on the Lebanese and Syrians and Jordanians to grant the Palestinian citizenship on the basis of the fact that they're the same people and that every other refugee problem in world history has been settled by people moving from one place to another, generally to be among people who are the same. When the German borders were, were reduced after World War II, Germans moved from Eastern Europe into Germany. The, Israeli, the uh, India, the uh, Pakistan partition in 1948, the Muslims moved west, the Hindus moved east for the most part. And uh, there's no reason why the Palestinian Arabs could not go to these other countries that are Arab Muslim countries, same as what they are, if these realities were actually recognized. But uh, right now we have policies that are still based on fiction and fantasy, and that's why our troubles persist. Thank you very much, and uh, we will go to questions now. Thank you, that was a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, everybody, I just wanted to mention again that you can raise your hand at the bottom of the page uh, in the participants area, um, and it's easier for us to call on you uh, if you have your hand up. Um, please try to keep your question or comment relatively short because we want to give everybody who has questions a chance. Uh, okay, I'd like to call on Steve Feldman, who is our uh, Philadelphia Executive Director. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Robert, very much for an excellent presentation. The question I have for you, it may sound like a distinction without a difference, but I think it's important how we wage this battle. Do you believe that, the, that most of the world is, is either anti-Jewish or pro-Arab and pro-Muslim as the basis for, for this war and, and supporting the Arabs? That's an excellent question. There, a whole book could be written about that, but I think it's a little, a bit of combination of both. Of course, there's a uh, tremendous strain of anti-Semitism in Christianity. And so even post-Christian Europe, 
I think, is altogether willing to embrace the anti-Semitism that is less recognized, actually, but is much more virulent and deeply embedded in Islam. And so they have mass Muslim migration now into Europe, and the Europeans are happy to uh, adapt themselves culturally to the Muslims because the Muslims are not going to adapt to European culture. And part of that involves accepting a level of anti-Semitism that has not been seen in Europe since the time of Hitler. The uh, pro-Arab part of it is partly due to financial considerations that of course many of the European countries and other countries uh, are dependent upon Arab oil, but also uh, it's simple violent intimidation yet again. I think that a great many people uh, in all sorts of contexts, like uh, very briefly, for example, there was an incident in an Arizona college, uh, community college just the other day where a professor was threatened with death for a few of his questions about Islamic terrorism. Muslim students threatened to kill him and the college demanded that he apologize. And I think that that's just uh, bowing once again to violent intimidation. They're afraid the Muslim students are gonna start blowing stuff up. And so they uh, pretend that they have great respect and that they have to do what they want. And that writ large is the situation that we see in Europe and many, many other places today. <clears throat> great, um, Meyer Herzl Malamed, are you on? You have to unmute yourself. I saw that you had a, que a question online. Is, is my you know, I, yeah, I was just asking about the um, the surahs, uh, uh, Mr. Spencer. You quoted uh, the the, uh, the surah where the the arrows are supposed to defeat those who chase them out, um, but I'm not sure the context of that particular one. I know that there are a number of surahs which recognize the Jewish claim to the Holy Land and welcome the Jews back to the Holy Land. It just depends on who's talking and who decides to emphasize the anti-Jewish ones or the pro-Jewish ones. Uh, how to do some, you respond to that? To some degree, but if you, you'll note that there is among all the Muslim states, 57 countries in the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, there's not one of them that supports Israel. And so in other words, there is not one country where those passages of the Quran that give the land to the Jews recognize that as decisive. And there's the primary reason for that is because this is not just a matter of which you choose to emphasize. The Quran is uh, not organized chronologically, but it's interpreted chronologically in Islamic tradition. That is, the passages that are considered to have been revealed later cancel out the ones that are, cons that are considered to have been revealed earlier. The passages where Allah says that he's giving the land of Israel to the Jews come earlier than the passages that say that the Jews are under the curse of Allah and are the enemies of Allah and all sorts of other terribly anti-Semitic things that are in the Quran. Also, it is very important to remember in this context that the Quran in chapter three, verse 67, says Abraham is not a Jew or a Christian, Abraham is a Muslim. And you might think that's absurd. How could Abraham be a Muslim when he comes before Islam? It's because the idea in the Quran is that all the prophets of the Bible, all the prophets of the Jews teach Islam. They were all Muslims. And then <clears throat> the Jews of today or the Jews of some ancient time, but long after the prophets, twisted their teachings to reject Muhammad and Islam and to create what is modern Judaism. It's the same thing with Christianity. They say Jesus was a Muslim as well and a Muslim prophet and the Christians twisted his teachings to create Christianity. So the original religion of the Jews is Islam and of the Jewish prophets, it's Islam. And consequently, the promise of Israel to the Jews is really a promise of Israel to the Muslims, the true Jews. I know that that sounds absurd, but that really is standard basic Islamic doctrine. You take, for example, the, uh, you remember the Ground Zero Mosque controversy from 10 years ago, 
when there were Muslim groups that were going to build a 16-story mosque by Ground Zero. And anyway, didn't happen. Long story. But uh, the imam who was fronting the project, Faisal Abdul Rauf, he's still in New York. He's still very powerful and influential in all the right circles. And he once uh, got everybody all excited when he said, I consider myself a Jew. I have always considered myself a Jew. And everybody thought, oh, he's so wonderful. He's so generous. He's so tolerant. He's so ecumenical. Actually, what he was saying was, I'm a Muslim. And therefore, I believe in the true religion of Moses, which is Islam. Thank you. And there's discussion of this in the book, by the way, too. Um, R Richard Harris, please. Yes. Um, Palestinian delusions. Uh, delusions is a symptom of a psychotic process. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are about why a significant percentage of our Jewish brothers and sisters are delusional uh, regarding the peace process and the two-state solution um, as you're describing. I think that to a tremendous degree, the delusion comes from people finding reality too difficult and too terrible to encompass, to contemplate. Have you ever read uh, Victor Klemperer's diaries from World War II? He was uh, a uh, professor, a Jewish professor in Germany. He was married to a non-Jew. And consequently, he was not sent to the camps. He was actually just about to be sent to the camps in 1945 when he uh, was, he, he lived in Dresden. And so Dresden was firebombed and he was able to get free and he survived the war. But the point about Victor Klemperer, his diaries are a couple of the most extraordinary books that I've ever read and I highly recommend them. They're very harrowing. It's day-to-day -day life in Nazi Germany for a Jew. It's, it's, it's terrible reading, but essential reading. And one of the most striking things about the books are that in 1939 and 1940, 1941, he Klemperer is saying, he says every now and again, it's almost midnight. Things are getting very bad. But he still thinks it's not midnight yet. He doesn't realize it's 3 a.m. He doesn't realize, because he's in the thick of it, how bad the situation really is. It's too terrible to contemplate, to encompass in his mind. And I think that that is, to a tremendous degree, what it is. Uh, I, I constantly find this, actually, when I'm speaking to all kinds of different audiences. People say, can't you give us any good news? Well, I'm sorry, there isn't any. In other words, what they want is a solution, because Americans, particularly, they want a solution. They, they want to, you, you gave them a problem, give them a solution. So here's a problem that the, the, you have the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. What's the solution? There is no solution. The solution is only that the problem can be managed. The, as long as there are believers in Islam, believers in jihad, there will be war against Israel. <clears throat> but people don't want to hear that. They, want, they think, well, there must be some way. Somehow we can come to make a deal with these people and they'll settle down. And that is unfortunately not the case. The problem can be managed and could easily be managed, actually, but it cannot be solved. It will always be with us. Thank you so much. Uh, Richard Harris next. Richard Harris. Richard Harris, are you there? Yes, I, I just asked my question and he oh, responded. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, Karen Herberts. Hi. Oops. Can you unmute me? You are unmuted. Oh, I'm unmuted. Okay, hi. Thank you for that really excellent presentation. The, um, the question that I have is, uh, I don't know, I agree with you that it's not going to be possible to resolve the conflict because I think it is based on Islam. And I think that starting way back with Yasser Arafat, he's always told the people, all, all of his people, 
that we will not stop jihad. We will take back the land. Uh, we will conquer Jerusalem. The Oslo Accords were only a temporary truce, like uh, the temporary truce between Muhammad and the uh, Quraysh tribe, which was later broken. This is what these people have been raised on. They have been um, told this for forever, in spite of the fact that the Oslo Accords were supposed to outlaw this kind of incitement, it has not ceased for one minute. So, uh, and in spite of the fact that they are, um, I mean, and, and uh, Jews are murdered in Israel and worldwide all of the time based on this concept of we will fight them wherever we find them. Uh, the world does not accept that it is an Islam an Islamic problem. So, uh, what's your? <laughs> how do you approach that? Well, I wrote this book actually. <laughs> uh, that was actually one of the main reasons why I wrote it. Uh, this is not just an advertisement. I'm explaining that uh, what I wanted to do was uh, show that there is a huge Islamic component to this. Because in this area, as well as in others around the world, the first thing that the fighters tell us is that they're fighting because of Islam. And the first thing that the experts and the State Department analysts and such discount is Islam. And I'm saying we should have enough respect for these people to take them at their word and to at least understand how they see what they're doing. And if we don't do that, it's to our own detriment. So I the only thing I can say to that is to try to tell people, to explain to them that this is, does provide the key to understanding this conflict and that otherwise it's inexplicable. After all, there have been refugee problems around the world for centuries. There have been <clears throat> displaced people. There have been people who were really driven out of some area or another. And every last refugee problem has been solved. You do not have refugees for in Europe anymore. They, they were there in the 40s, millions of them, and everybody found a place. You do not have refugees in India and Pakistan anymore. There were millions of them, but the situation was solved. Only with the Palestinians is refugee status by United Nations decree passed on from children to grandchildren to great-grandchildren and so on. So these absurdities we should be continually pointing out. And trying to note how absurd all this is and how false the premises are upon which it is all based. We know that the platforms that we have, I see that uh, there's a question here in the comments about, well, 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 sure, but when is CNN and NBC and MSNBC going to talk about these things? Well, they're not. <laughs> but if we do, then uh, you never know. Things can change so quickly. I remember in the mid-80s, long before any of you were born, uh, it looked as if the Soviet Union was going to be there forever. And there were even commentators on uh, the networks, not CNN then, but, you know, the other ones saying, um, we have to deal with the Soviet Union for decades to come. Ronald Reagan is being uh, reckless and this, this cowboy is going to get us into a nuclear war. We need to adapt. And of course, the Soviet Union was gone in a few years. The point is, if we keep telling the truth, we keep pushing at the wall, it could come down more quickly than anybody expects. After all, nobody expected Donald Trump, right? Right. And that, that's uh, certainly what COA tries to do all, all the time, tell the truth and keep telling the truth. And uh, that's our best, best defense. I know when uh, Mort testified in Congress, about hate crimes, he brought up the issue of uh, the Islamic contribution to that. And you know, one of the things that I think it's very unique about your book is that it, it speaks about the Islamic angle, uh, which, is, which is a key to understanding. Um, I guess ne next we have uh, David Masters. David Masters, are you there? Can you un unmute yourself? David? Um, all right. Okay, yes, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if um, if you could if I could throw two questions at you. One, um, do you uh, what do you think the chances are the probability that uh, 
that Trump will reinstate you and other patriotic experts as trainers of, um, of uh, defense, uh, excuse me, of intelligence agents like uh, you used to do up, I believe, up until 2011 when Obama uh, threw you guys out. And my second question is, do you believe that Trump, maybe in the second term, will uh, go all the way and outlaw the branch of the Quan uh, the care? Uh, if they will label care as terrorist and and shut down most of their activities in the USA? Well, certainly I would hope that he would do both, but uh, it's possible that he will do the second. I think that if he's reelected, that the initiative to declare the Muslim Brotherhood a terrorist group, and on that basis to prosecute the Council on American Islamic Relations very well could happen, and certainly should happen. And there's a strong case that can be made, even from the standpoint of just what's publicly available. Uh, in terms of my own uh, reinstatement, I'm not waiting by the phone. Uh, I understand this, the pressures that the president is under. The fact is that if I were uh, reinstated as an FBI trainer or something else, the, he would get another round of publicity, I mean, of, neg of denunciations and, and so on. I uh, don't think he cares particularly about that but he knows where to choose his battles. And so, like I say, not waiting by the phone. Okay, thank you. Who does he trust most on these topics though? I don't know. I tell you, I was very depressed when he dismissed. Asking, who does he trust? Yeah, who does he trust on these topics? I was very uh, upset when he dismissed Bannon and Gorka despite the fact that I don't uh, agree 100% with either one of them. But nonetheless, they certainly have a better grasp of this issue than most people. And I thought that uh, with uh, H.R. McMaster as the NSA and Bannon and Gorka gone, that he was going to go in the wrong direction. And he got better than ever. So maybe he just knows it himself. I don't know. He's a very interesting guy. Um, Je Jeffrey Sheff. Is Jeffrey there? Jeff Jeffrey Chef? Myself. Uh, yes, Mr. Spencer, I believe that um, hmm, tactically it may be better to concentrate on the Palestinian delusion than the whole Islamic world. I think in the United States, especially, and I'm sure across the world, and even in Israel, uh, shown by the Temple Mount problems they've had putting security there, there is an unwillingness to start a conflict with one and a half billion Muslims. It would be much better to concentrate on the Palestinians because many Muslim nations or some Muslim nations now do not necessarily
<clears throat> none of them that have uh, friendly relations with Israel. Some of them are making accords in various ways. Even Saudi Arabia now is working on various kinds of cooperative uh, initiatives with Israel because the Saudis want help of Israel of wherever they can get it against Iran. But those alliances will always be alliances of convenience because of Islamic imperatives to wage war against unbelievers. Any kind of alliance with Israel is going to be temporary and will be broken when it is no longer needed. There okay, was um, an excuse, me, excuse me, we just have to give everybody a chance. I'm sorry. Um, Leland Franklin? Franklin? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Sorry, we just have to give everybody a chance. Leland Frankman? Um, I'm sitting here in Naples, Florida, drenched by sunshine, but my grandfather went there from Russia in the 1890s, married in Jerusalem, owned land, farmed land, and is buried on the Mount of Olives in 1936. So I have some history there. But I, I uh, but that, that's not my question. My question is, it seems to me that the Arab countries that are near uh, Israel are somewhat schizophrenic because uh, the king of Jordan, not the current king, but his father, would come on, meet the press, and say that there must be justice for the Palestinians. They must have their land. They must have a country. The same thing with the Saudi uh, representatives that came on TV. But it would seem, I want to ask you, do they really want a Palestinian country there? Their Palestinians have been nothing but trouble. They were trouble in Lebanon. We know about that. They were Black September in Jordan, uh, when uh, Saddam Hussein attacked Kuwait, my understanding is the Saudis threw all the Palestinians out of Saudi Arabia because they were supporting Saddam Hussein, and I don't think it'd be another Belgium. So despite what they say, do they really want a Palestinian country near them? Yeah. I think they really do, actually, because the alternative is to have the Palestinians in their own countries. And we already saw, as you noted, the Lebanese don't want that. They expelled them. Kuwait expelled them. Others have expelled them. Uh, and so this is not something that they, uh, they would prefer to have them off in their own place so they don't have to deal with them themselves. And it's important also to remember that, uh, oh, the Baha'is, by the way, are not Muslims at all, but that's another story. Um, that was uh, somebody wrote in the comments there that the Baha'is are a form of tolerant Islam. The Baha'is are not Islam. Anyway, the uh, religious imperative, the Islamic imperative, is something that obviously I'm stressing as being key to understanding this conflict, but it's not the only thing in it. It's not that just uh, the, the sole motivation or the sole consideration that any of these states have. And so they might uh, not, they might have other reasons to not want to deal with the Palestinians, uh, to not want to have them in their own land and so on. I think we should put pressure, as I said before, on them in various ways in order to take these people, but they don't want them. In any case, I think the fact that they don't want them leads to the next possible alternative, which is a Palestinian state, as far as they're concerned. Um, Cheryl Silver? Cheryl? Okay. Cheryl? Uh, hold it. Uh, okay, there. I'm muted. Thank you, Liz. Uh, thank you, Robert. What a fabulous presentation. So many myths dispelled. Um, my question is, uh, I recall attending a Michigan ZOA event years ago, which the speaker referred to Jordan's original name, I believe was Palestina. And my dad was alive, the original Zionist, he and my mom and the family, COA members. Uh, he too said, Jordan already is the Palestinian state. Is there any way that in managing this issue, um, A, do you think that President Trump knows these historical facts and can in any way, uh, you know, uh, if there's anything that can be done about uh, insisting that Jordan 
take, I believe most of its residents or many of its, its residents and, are, and citizens already are Palestinians, are originally of Palestinian descent. Is there any way to solve the problem this way? In the first place, 100% of the Jordanians are Palestinians. We often hear that uh, some percentage, I forget what it is actually, but some percentage is Palestinian and some is Jordanian. All that is the distinction there is that they're saying some of them are from the west side of the river and some of them are from the east side of the river. That's it. So are the people uh, on, on, in New Jersey ethnically different from the people in Manhattan? It's, it's, just, a, it's just a river between, well, okay, maybe to some degree. But in any case, the people on the west side of the river and the people on the east side of the Jordan River are not ethnically, linguistically, culturally, or religiously different from one another. And so the land there also, as I explained, was part of the original mandate for Palestine. The eastern part of it was split away, taken away to create this Arab state. And the people there are exactly the same in every important respect as the Palestinian Arabs. So, yeah, we ought to be saying that Jordan is the Palestinian state. It already exists. And so the Palestinians who want a homeland, they already got it. They can just go, very short drive, and they're there. And this uh, ought to be said. I do not have any idea whether Trump knows it or not. He has never given any public indication of knowing it. But President Trump is a very surprising individual in many ways. And I think anybody would be unwise to underestimate his knowledge, the breadth of his knowledge or intelligence. I think that uh, it's well known that he says in his book, The Art of the Deal, from way back in the 80s, I guess it was, that uh, always make your opponent think that you are not as bright as you really are. And I think he's doing that now, and people are falling for it in a tr to a tremendous degree. But that the move of the embassy to Jerusalem indicates that he is aware of issue the salient issues in this conflict to a degree probably much more than other presidents have been and so he may know this as well but he's not saying it he should be saying um uh, len gets len are you there len had to go i saw len say he was leaving before oh okay um kevin ross kevin thanks liz um Richard, first of all, uh, before my quick question, I just want to thank you for all of your amazing work. You are truly one of the great leaders for freedom, and uh, I just want to salute you and thank you for everything you do for, for, for this country and for Israel. Thank you, but um, my name is Robert. I have to say this. It's very important. Well, I Richard, said Robert, right? Yeah, Robert okay. is my name, Robert Spencer. Robert, yes. Uh, excuse me if I uh, beg your pardon. I may have, uh, I'm actually emailing someone while I was waiting for my turn whose name is Richard. So I beg your pardon. I may if I, uh, <laughs> did you get confused with the other Richard Spencer, which is now why I realize why the need to correct. I am not the other Richard Spencer. I'm Robert. <laughs> of course, yes. Robert, thank you. I'm sorry. Um, this is a book club, and you know that the, uh, the ZOA is, uh, you know what we do. And, um, one of the things that I really appreciate about your answers is how incredibly informed they are. You're, you're uh, really a, a great scholar. And um, what books have you come across that you can recommend to us that we should consider taking a look at that you felt spoke to uh, the issue with uh, the, the Palestinian delusion, the Palestinian, the, the, the conflict, so to speak, the ongoing Arab war against Israel and the Jewish people and so forth. Uh, we want to arm ourselves with as much knowledge and to be effective as, uh, as possible, Robert. What yeah. books Great can question. you recommend that we check out? Great question. Um, Thanks, Kevin. Of course, I expect, because Liz mentioned it earlier, Battleground by Shmuel Katz is something that you're familiar with. Uh, certainly everybody should read that. And from Time Immemorial as well. Those two give a uh, good background to the conflict. I used both as sources for the Palestinian delusion. Also, in a larger sense, the uh, Islam and Dimitude and the Dimmi by Batya Or 
uh, as histories of the area and histories of the treatment of non-Muslim minorities in Islamic societies, very extraordinarily important books. And so uh, those I think are essential to understanding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as well as a great many other conflicts around the world. I could go on and on, but uh, once you read those, give me an email, I'll send you some more. Great, thank you. Uh, Gina Ross, please. Gina, are you there? Gina? Yeah, I'm, here. I'm here, I just uh, uh, muted myself. Um, Robert, thank you very much for all of this. I have a question. Uh, there has, there's been a lot of movement I've noticed, and I'm hoping to publish an article about this very soon, where some leaders in the Arab and the Muslim uh, world are trying to start, are starting to talk about friendship with the Jews and being, being in touch with Israel and we are cousins and all of that stuff. So I'm just wondering if we can work towards uh, a movement to happen in Islam, the same thing that it happened with Christianity. I totally agree with you about the whole concept of the Ummah and Islam and all of that stuff. I totally understand it. And something happened that's extraordinary with Nostra Aetate. And I'm just wondering if we can try to direct the, the, the movement of the thinking towards that kind of reform in Islam, because it started to happen. And you're right, a billion and a half Muslims are not all jihadists, most of them are not, but there are maybe 200 million that are, and that's more than enough to be a real problem. So can we, do you think there could be an orientation towards that? The idea of reform in Islam is much different from the idea of reform in Christianity. The uh, Nostra Aetate came out of the fact that there was always, from the beginning of Christianity, opposition to anti-Semitism. I do not mean to downplay or deny Christian anti-Semitism to any degree. It, is, it, it, it goes all the way through the history of Christianity. It was uh, very virulent, very, very ugly, very brutal, and very violent in many areas. And yet there was always opposition within Christianity itself. The difference in Islam is that, well, the opposition is not there. Uh, and people might say, yes, but Jews lived in Muslim countries for centuries. Certainly they did, but they did not do so as equal citizens. They did so under the strictures of Islamic law, which mandates uh, that the Jews and Christians and other non-Muslims submit to the hegemony of the Muslims and, and accept the denial of basic rights. This is what Batyaur details in the Dimmi and Islam and Dimitude, that uh, the, the, uh, the non-Muslims have to be in a state of subordination to show the victory and superiority of Islam at all times. And so <clears throat> it's a very different situation. You do not have a theological tradition or a legal tradition in Islam of opposition to anti-Semitism. It's just not there. What's more, you don't even have an openness to the possibility of reform uh, in uh, both in all, in all revealed religions, in all Abrahamic religions, you could say, there's the idea that there are some aspects of the religion that are uh, irreformable and unchangeable because they were given by God. And then there are other aspects that are expressions that are more human expressions that can be changed. Now, this is, of course, a huge subject that uh, could take us in all kinds of different directions. But the primary purpose, the primary point is that in Islam, there is uh, a much wider scope of the realm, of a much wider group of things that are considered to be the irreformable aspects that come from God than there are in Christianity. So you have, for example, the chapter five, verse three of the Quran, which says, this day I have perfected your religion for you. If Allah has perfected the religion of Islam for the Muslims, then obviously it doesn't need to be reformed. It doesn't need to be changed. It's already perfect. As far as uh, uh, Ken is asking, uh, what of Ijtihad? Ijtihad is the, indeed the reinterpretation of the Islamic sources in order to come to a new legal uh, determination, a new legal ruling on a disputed question. 
but uh, a lot of people are aware of that term nowadays without knowing uh, that the, the so-called gate of Ijtihad closed in the 11th century. That in the scheme of uh, mainstream standard Sunni Islamic theology, and of course the Sunnis are most Muslims around the world, 85 to 90 percent, they believe that uh, the Quran and the Sunnah, the teachings of Muhammad, were given and then they were explained by scholars, uh, <clears throat> distilled by scholars into the teachings of Islamic law, and that that effort was finished with the death of the last of the great scholars who formulated Islamic law, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, in the year 1055. And so with the death of Ahmad ibn Hanbal in 1055, Ijtihad is over. And there are no more interpretations of Islamic law in order to determine a new legal conclusion. The only thing that can happen now is the application of the already determined legal conclusions to new situations. And so the, the various schools of jurisprudence all agree that there should be jihad against unbelievers. He, that, that's not going to be changed. Uh, if anybody says, well, we should reopen the gate of Ijtihad, we should uh, uh, reinterpret all this, then they're going to be condemned. They're going to be under a disadvantage as a result of that. Mahmoud Muhammad Taha in 1985 was a Sudanese theologian who said he tried to uh, practice Ijtihad and to interpret the Quran in a way that would uh, establish passages that are more tolerant as taking precedence over passages that are more violent. When mainstream Islamic tradition took the passages that were more violent over the ones that were more tolerant. And he was hanged as a heretic. So this is the difficulty of Islamic reform. <clears throat> um, we have, I think, about 11 or 12 more people who have questions. Do you mind if we do those three at once and then you'll answer? Uh, would that work for you, Robert? Okay, because that, that, uh, otherwise we're going to run out of time. And if people, please keep your questions short because we have so many people who want to ask questions today. Um, so the three people, uh, Jack Rosenblum, Adam Pollock, and Robin Benoff, in that order, if you could ask your questions. <clears throat> Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, Robert, first of all, thank you very much for taking the time and uh, your service to both Jewish people in Israel. Thank you. Um, the one thing that I didn't hear discussed is basically how this ties in, uh, whether the, the active participants of the Arab people who call themselves Palestinians, whether it's Hezbollah or Hamas or Islamic Jihad or Fatah, they all are dictatorships in a form. They all control their people with an iron fist and they all use uh, the Islamic uh, beliefs to incite their people against the Jews. They have no interest whatsoever in changing things because they're stealing whatever they can grab their hands on the billions of dollars that have been given to them. And why should they change? It's in their interest to keep the fires stoked. Yeah, I don't think they're going to change. And I don't think there's, they'll be overthrown either because there's no democratic tradition in uh, Islam. There's no, no uh, history of any free societies. Uh, secular Turkey was, ex was founded as a rejection of political Islam, and now, of course, it's going the other way. And there's no other secular country you can name in the Islamic world. It doesn't exist. Uh, there are ones that don't, don't implement Islamic law in its fullness, but that's as close as you can get. All of them are authoritarian. And all of them are authoritarian because Islam itself is inherently authoritarian. And Muhammad in a Hadith uh, says, you should always obey your ruler, even if he's sinful, even if he's an Ethiopian with a head like a raisin. That's his quote. <laughs> and so uh, this discourages political change and leads to an acceptance and acquiescence 
to authoritarianism. So not only do they have, the rulers have an incentive to continue the status quo, but also the people who are ruled take for granted that this is the way things are just always going to be. Um, Adam Pollack and then Robin Benoff, if you could ask, ask them or ask your questions, Sirianum, and thanks. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, if I heard you correctly, you said two things that differ from what I had uh, learned previously. One was that the reason for the pan-Arab um, goal of driving the Jews into the sea and reclaiming the land is because they were expelled, the Palestinians were expelled from, uh, from the land. I had thought that there were two other reasons. One, that um, it, it was just simply land that at one time was held by Muslims, which I set forth in the book that you mentioned uh, from time to time immortal, that it's just really a pretext to keep the, uh, the political um, climate within each of these Arab countries under control. The second thing you said that I had not known, I'd like you to maybe drill down on both of these, is that, um, the, that in fact, the, the Palestinians, which use that term, were expelled. Uh, I'm sorry, we're, we're not expelled, but left voluntarily. And I had learned that it was a mixture, that in fact, um, in some cases, they left voluntarily because they were incited to do so by, the, by their own people. But secondly, that there were certainly a, 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 a number of instances where they were uh, threatened, but they didn't leave, they'd be killed. And, and since, since because of the first question, I think the second one is so important as well. Thank okay. you. The, uh... Yeah, they were expelled. There were some cases where the uh, Israeli Defense Forces told them that they had to leave because the uh, they had been clearly involved in waging war against the Israelis. And so they weren't just innocent non-combatants who were caught up in the crossfire. And this is, of course, obscured nowadays for political purposes. But if you go back to the time that it all happened, but there's abundant evidence in regard to the uh, fact that they left voluntarily. Abundant contemporary evidence from the Arabs themselves. I've got it all in the book. I'll just uh, note one. The Near East Arabic Broadcasting Station on April 3rd, 1949 said, it must not be forgotten that the Arab Higher Committee encouraged the refugees' flight from their homes in, in Haifa and Jerusalem. And the Egyptian daily Akbar al Yom said, May 15th, 1948 arrived. On that day, the Mufti of Jerusalem appealed to the Arabs of Palestine, note that he doesn't say the Palestinians, to leave the country because the Arab armies were about to enter and fight in their stead. And so this is, they, this is something they were ordered to do. Uh, and I can note in, in connection with the last question, they were ordered to do it in an authoritarian context where you obey your, the ruler. And so they left. There were, the, there were some who were told to leave because they were themselves combatants. Or, and you know, of course, the, the Palestinians have always been masters at uh, mixing combatants with non-combatants. And that is deliberately designed to confuse the situation and make it look as if the Israelis are targeting non-combatants. But that was never the case. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's an excellent section in the book, uh, in Robert's book about this, about you know, the, the quote, the quote after quote, um, from original sources um, showing that it was the Arab High Command and even the Mufti of Jerusalem that uh, told the Arabs to leave. And it's also covered in, um, you know, in, in battleground. Um, but I, I think Robert has even more, more uh, information about that. I can tell you that I do because I uh, used battleground as a source and then I found in other places quite a few other testimonies to the fact that the uh, that the Arabs had left voluntarily. And I thought that was such an important point that I included them all. So there's quite a bit of document. I think there's more documentation of the fact that the Arabs left voluntarily in the Palestinian delusion than in any other book that I know of. I would agree with that. Definitely, it's fantastic. Fantastic section on that. If you um, can the first part of the question. Um, excuse, excuse me, I, I can't, I can't. Yeah. We have to I, let other people ask questions. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, Robin? <laughs> Yeah. Hi, this was fantastic. Thank you. It's my first time joining. I really appreciate it. But I don't understand. It's like preaching to the choir. 
all of my friends and people in Teaneck that I deal with, and whether they're reform or conservative or orthodox, they totally are, have bought into the plan of what the people have said with the Palestinians having a right to be back and a right to be there. Is there a way to educate the masses of Jews to hear what you're saying? A lot of people don't want to hear it, but if you can, if you have friends, maybe they'll sit still and listen and you could just read them out the, uh, the things I just read out about the Arabs leaving voluntarily. They don't want to hear from me. They consider me the enemy. So <laughs> well, it's really a, a real problem, a very big problem. The problem is that people are not, uh, they don't t work on the basis of evidence. They work on the basis of feelings. But and even in the synagogues, I think dealing with the rabbis, I yeah. think the rabbis spew dialogue that needs to be adjusted to what yeah. you're talking about i have been uh i've experienced that myself but in any case people do not they're not reasonable you know you, the only yeah. thing you can do is give them evidence but a lot of people will just go with what they feel and that's one of the reasons why the palestinians were invented because they were they're really just a play on the um, uh emotions of the world to create a scenario in which the Israelis can be portrayed as the villains. But they have such a good Robin, propaganda. Robin, 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 we can't, we can't, we can't go back and forth because we need to give other people a chance. Thank you so much. I'm, thank you for your great comments. Um, uh, Steve, Steve Gilbert, and what, well, by the way, what I would say to that is you just keep hitting at them. You just keep telling the truth and because sometimes it sinks in even if they don't, don't admit it right away. I had somebody come back to me 10 years later and tell me, that he completely changed my, my his mind um, because of something I had said ten years before, and I had no idea that that had happened. So if you keep speaking the truth, and you know, and have them read Robert's book and Battleground and all these important books, they'll they'll learn. Um, Steve, Gilbert. Yes, I have to stay close yes. to you. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Um, my question is is as follows: Isn't the critical issue here? Uh, analysis is great, but isn't the critical issue one of strategy and tactics? Um, Robert, you used the term big lie, and what that really means is this is really a battle in the, in, in, in the realm of uh, propaganda. And the question is, is, this not, is there not a need for aggressive counter-propaganda? Two, if that's the case, how do you craft an, an effective message to get it out? And lastly, how do you get it out? especially given the bias of the media? I think it was easy to uh, craft an effective message. The getting it out is the problem. Uh, it's, it's because the truth is so clear here and so abundantly documented. It would be easy to uh, put up some posters to develop some materials of that kind uh, that explain that there are no Palestinians, that explain that, uh, that the Arabs were not driven out of Israel, all these things we've been discussing wouldn't be hard to put together at all. And the David Horowitz Freedom Center, with which I'm affiliated, has actually done this. In many cases, developed materials specifically for college campuses to uh, counter a lot of the lies coming out of Students for Justice in Palestine and others. The problem is getting it out because uh, the Colleges in particular are not interested in airing both sides of the issue and the media. The, the biggest problem that we face is that we are being deplatformed, we're being silenced, we're being ignored, and so on. And consequently, that's the, where we really need to be fighting. I don't, I, it mystifies me every day. You know, uh, I, don't, I don't ordinarily look because it's depressing, but I, I did look the other day at my... Uh, uh, numbers, the number of readers at my website, jihadwatch.org, and it's less than half of what it was just a couple of years ago. And that's not because people are no longer interested in the issue, it's because uh, Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and Google, they've all shut us down. And so people don't, uh, they can't come. Uh, they don't know that it's there in the ways that they, they had access to it before. And it's not just me, of course, that this is happening to. Uh, it's happening to people who are dissenting from the far left agenda all across the board. And yet the conservative leaders, the Republican Party, nobody seems to care about this. And uh, the longer it goes on, the less we're going to be able to speak. And so that 
very much has to be addressed, but is not being addressed. One of the things that we do at ZOA, and I'm holding it up right now, is to try to, to simplify a lot of these issues. And we, for instance, we have this book called The Myth of Occupation Fact, Israel Does Not Occupy Arab Land, you know, a, a, which we hand out on the college, especially at the college campuses, but other places that we speak, um, that tries to, to put the key facts before people in a very sim simplified manner. And I think that's, you know, that's also important. I mean, we need the books that go into the depth and to encourage people to read that, but we also need these simplified um, methods of, of getting the message across, which is one of the things that ZOA does on a lot of campuses also. Um, uh, I'd like to have uh, the next three, I, I mean, we're really running running late. Do you, do you, do you want to uh, uh, mind staying a little later or, or should we? Uh... I don't mind if people want to stay. Um, I'll try to be briefer in my answers. I can, oh no, uh, the answers. <laughs> we enjoyed this so much, your, 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 all your answers. Okay, so let me take three people at once. If, if you can, uh, Ron, where? I hope I remember is all. That's that's the problem. I'll uh, forget <laughs> the question by the time we get to the third one. Okay, Ron, Ron Warren, D. Leibowitz, and Greta Revsky, in that order. Ron, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, my question, I have two questions. One is, first, uh, <laughs> curiosity about your your own personal security is number one. And number two is I noticed that there is a tremendous increase recently in people walking around in Islamic garb. Um, can you talk about what the motivation for this is and uh, why is this happening at this time in history? Okay. Do you want to get the other two questions? Or yeah, let's I... get the other two questions quickly. Uh, Dee Leibowitz, are you there? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, a tremendous presentation, sir. Tremendous. Um, Earlier, you mentioned that, that the problem can be managed. Uh, I was always taught that managing a problem is a little bit of a defeatist way of doing it, and it really doesn't ever uh, become a winner. Uh, could you speak to that? Okay, and Greta Revsky? Greta? Greta, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Um, just uh, the paradox of saying that um, the ethnically and uh, religiously and otherwise, the Palestinian Arabs are the same as all of the other Arabs, that's great. But then why do not the other Arabs in all those other countries uh, not recognize Palestinian Arabs as uh, ethnically equal and don't want them in their countries if they're the same? Okay, got thank it. you. Got them all. Okay. Uh, I remembered the concept of taking notes. Now, um, as far as my personal security goes, I do speak when, uh, back in the days when there were live audiences, I would uh, have security with me because, of course, uh, anybody who's in this line gets a lot of death threats. Uh, it's a peaceful religion, you know, and so they uh, <laughs> issue these threats all the time. Um, as, uh, oh, Islamic garb. I, I took notes, but now I can't read my own notes. Islamic garb uh, is indeed much more prevalent in the United States than it used to be because there's so many more Muslims here, but also because it does seem as if there is a conscious decision to create a uh, sense of a presence that uh, women are wearing hijab everywhere when Muslim women, you know, even in Egypt 50 years ago were mostly didn't wear hijab. Uh, a little bit before 50 years ago, Nasser, the president of Egypt, even says, uh, you try to make them wear hijab when the Muslim Brotherhood was saying that women should wear hijab. You tell them, you know. But uh, nowadays, I think that it's all part of the imperative to ultimately bring Islam and impose it upon the non-Muslim. When you understand that they have this doctrine of warfare against unbelievers and the subjugation of unbelievers, then the presence of uh, Muslims wearing Muslim garb is a statement that they are here, they're not going anywhere, they are not uh, assimilating, they are not accepting American mores and customs, but maintaining their own, and that means that there's going to be conflict in the future. Uh, in other words, it is an, an, an attempt to intimidate. Uh, is managing the problem defeatist? Well, I don't think so. All I mean by saying that is that there's never going to be a time when we can say, well, there's no more war against Israel. 
Israel is now at a definitive state of peace with all of its neighbors and will now live in security and harmony with them. Now, of course, I guess you could say that about every country, that peace has been a vanishing prospect all through human history. But because of the particular doctrines of jihad that have created the war against Israel, it's never going to be in a, in a position of absolute security. But the problem can be managed in the sense that, as I said before, the jihadis who are trying to destroy Israel are so few in number and so weak that they're not significant. And we could be working toward that, and I believe we should be working toward that. And that's not in the least defeatist, it's just the opposite. And why do not the neighboring Arab countries recognize that the Palestinian Arabs are just more Arabs like they are? Well, it's because they hate Israel and want to destroy it because of the same jihad imperative. And so they realize the value of the Palestinians as a stick to beat Israel with in numerous ways. The refugee problem, the, I, the demonization of the IDF, on and on and on. There's so many ways in which the Palestinians are useful. And if the uh, Arab states recognize that they were just more Arabs, the, that useful weapon would be taken away from them. They would be voluntarily relinquishing it. Thank you for taking my question. Great. Great. Um, okay, we have four more people. Do, uh, do you mind if we call on everybody at once to uh, okay. list the questions? Okay, Fran Malkin, Alan Skorsky, Carol Weiss, and Julia Lutch in that order. Okay, so Fran Malkin. Fran, are you there? Hi, I've had a hand up the whole time. Can I be yes. the fifth one? Yeah, Fran, is this Fran? A bar? Oh, Oh we, didn't see, oh, we didn't see your hand on, on the virtual hand. Okay, we'll get you afterwards. We'll get you afterwards, okay? I got it. I got it. Okay, um, I have two questions. Uh, one, do you think that uh, Israel will sign this agreement now, the Trump agreement uh, or the Trump plan? And the second one, is uh, the problem I have is most of my Jewish liberal neighbors, in fact, all of them are so anti-Trump and because, I don't know what they think, but don't they realize that he has been so supportive of Israel and they hate him and they'll all vote against him. And they, they and they just don't see it. We don't see eye to eye. And I'm sure you've come across those people. And when you say anything, you're a homophobe, xenophobe. And they have this mantra that they have to defeat Trump and bring in this guy, uh, Biden, who would, to me, mean bringing back the Obama-Biden program because they'll be running it. So what I see, I don't think they see in their Jews. So that's the question. The first one is, do you think the plan will be implemented? Hey, thank you. Um, Alan, Alan Skorsky, very good questions. Alan? Mr. Spencer, it's an honor, sir. So I'll be very quick with two quick questions, but I'll be kind of blend together. Um, I wrote a book a few years ago called Israel Betrayed. And my two questions are the kind of comments, I'd like your response. Number one, there's a group called Palestinian Media Watch that cites verbatim what's coming out of the Palestinian Authority with quotes like, all of Israel has occupied Palestine and the Oslo Accords were just a ruse to replace Israel with that alone, why are we even having this discussion any longer? The second question, real quickly, is you've identified a lot of our enemies. Um, what I don't think we've done enough of is stigmatizing people like Peter Beinart, if not now, Trua, JVP. They have legitimized the squad. They've legitimized Linda Sarsour. And the Democrats could not do to us what they are doing without the support of these people. And I think that we have to spend at least as much time stigmatizing them, publicizing them, because otherwise they're just another Jewish voice out there. Okay. Thank you. Um, you know, maybe we should take those two now, so, and then, and the other, then the others afterwards. Um, Robert? Yeah. Uh, will Israel sign the Trump plan? I think, yeah, sure, but 
I mean, Netanyahu uh, and Gantz have both said they would, but it's a dead letter anyway, because the Palestinians are not going to agree to it, as no. they made it before it even came out. And so it stands, as I said before, as I think a very useful uh, indication of who's the real obstacle to peace here. And that's perhaps its primary purpose, what its primary purpose was all along. Second, yeah, uh, I have encountered many times the uh, Jews who hate Trump, and they are certainly a great majority. Uh, I was speaking at, a, at, a, uh, at the invitation of a Rabbi Barry Silver, I don't know if any of you know him, in uh, Boca Raton, Florida, and he's very far to the left. We were talking about uh, the recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital, which uh, had just happened. And he said, yes, uh, but the embassy, when the embassy was moved, Trump had a prayer from a Christian preacher who says the Jews are going to hell. And, uh, you know, I didn't know this. I don't know if it's true even still, or if the <laughs> he says this, because not many Christians really say that nowadays. But in any case, uh, I said, okay, but is the ceremony over now? Yes. Is the embassy back in Tel Aviv? No, it's in Jerusalem. But he didn't care about the effect of the uh, action of Trump, just the optics of this, this what this preacher supposedly said. Uh, my point is actually just what I said before, that the, the, the opposition here is irrational. And the, the only thing we can do is keep telling the truth and trying to show people that we know and love that there is uh, no reason why anybody who supports Israel should not support uh, the re-election of President Trump, that he's been the most pro-Israel president ever since the founding of the modern state of Israel. Uh, and that includes every last one of his predecessors going back to Truman and including Truman. Uh, in the book, actually, I make, I, I make that clear by uh, detailing all the history of the interaction between the various presidents and Israel and the uh, Palestinian Arabs. And all of them were, were, were icy uh, quite a few of them were icy at best. Carter was actively hostile. Eisenhower was uh, not friendly. Nixon was not friendly. Uh, on and on and on. And Trump has uh, been extraordinary. So it's really not a rational opposition at this point. Uh, yes, Palestinian Media Watch is an excellent site. So also is the Middle East Media Research Institute. And they document, there's a, a mountain of documentation. As a matter of fact, in the book, The Palestinian Delusion, I devote a chapter to statements by uh, Palestinian Arab leaders uh, explaining that it's a religious war, it's based on Islam, the uh, peace negotiations are a sham, they will never make peace with Israel, very, very clearly and explicitly, and yet continually ignored and downplayed by, in Washington. I think here again, because Reality is too difficult to accept, too terrible to contemplate, and also because a lot of people would be out of a job if there's no peace process. It, after all, it's a self-perpetuating industry of its own at this point. And uh, yes, I certainly agree that we need to stigmatize uh, the pro-Jihad, uh, pro pro-Palestinian leftist Jews like Peter Beinart. Uh, the problem here, again, is that they have all the platforms and we don't. And so uh, that needs to be addressed very urgently. By, by the way, people may be pleased to hear that this morning I filed a claim with the AZM, the American Zionist Movement Judicial Tribunal, to um, remove Peter Beinart from the possibility of becoming a delegate in the World Zionist Congress because of his support for boycotts. Um, and we'll see what happens with that. Um, That's just the kind of thing that should be done. They should be challenged at every turn. Just like we are, you know, whenever I'm invited to speak anywhere, uh, the Council on American Islamic Relations and all the rest of them uh, gin up protests and get me canceled uh, more often than not. And this is a, here again, doesn't just happen to me, happens to everybody who speaks honestly about these issues. And so uh, we should be playing the same game. This is a war. Right. Okay, uh, next, uh, Car Carol Weiss. Um, uh, Barbara, the, the lady, I guess it's Barbara Shapiro, the lady who said she was been waiting for a long time, and Julia Lutch, um, and then I'll uh, give their con concluding remarks and, and announcements uh, for our future uh, book club meetings. 
This is Carol Weiss. I, uh, you already answered my question about UNRWA, how they want to expand refugees, and that's why the UN is paying an enormous amount of money. I just want to clarify, am I correct? The United States have, has withdrawn the money that uh, would be part of this fund, and am I incorrect to have read or believe that Netanyahu would like the money, the United States to continue paying the money. Should I go ahead or not? Yes, okay, all right, sure. Yeah, just briefly. Um, yes, as far as I understand, the White House has stopped the funding for UNRWA, and I have not heard that Netanyahu has said that they should not do so. Uh, I would be very surprised if that were the case, because- I UNRWA did hear him in a speech. I'm sorry, what was that? I did hear him in a speech with my Israeli friends and they translated what he said. So I, I wish I could find out whether I misunderstood my Israeli friends. Well, I sure hope so. It would not be consistent with his other public positions. Uh, and the fact is that the, uh, the, the UNRWA has been actively aiding the Palestinian Jihad uh, Hamas activities have been discovered in their schools and uh, teachers who actually are Hamas operatives teaching in those schools and so on and so on. So why Netanyahu would support such a thing, I can't fathom. And I, 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 it's hard to, for me to believe. I, don't, I, I hope that's not true and I doubt it is. By, by the way, on this whole funding issue, um, ZOA um, posted a press release and I guess it's been in some of the, uh, the the newspapers also uh, about Biden's statement last week saying that he would resume funding to the Palestinian Authority. And we're talking about a couple of hundred million dollars a year of our tax money, uh, which uh, ends up, you know, because money is fungible, ends up going to terrorists um, because of the Palestinians' payments to terrorists to murder Jews. And we have expressed our publicly expressed great concern about that and demanded that uh, Biden retract that. Excellent. Um, uh, let's see, uh, Bar Barbara Shapiro and then uh, Julia Lutch. Barbara? Just touching upon something you just mentioned this second, um, Biden and uh, Obama, when Biden was in Israel in 2010, and um, there was a settlement freeze, but not accepted in Yerushalayim, uh, and there were apartments announced, and that made everybody crazy. Um, but at the same time, there was um, a square being dedicated to Dalal Mugrabi, a terrorist, at exactly the same time that Biden was in Yerushalayim. And the, uh, uh, both Biden and Obama were not uh, phased by that. Uh, what really is disturbing is that what you just mentioned in terms of what Biden wanted to do now, but there's not the emphasis on Palestinian terrorism. Uh, so, but my original question was, with the breadth of his knowledge and intelligence, how could President Obama justify 2334? You'd have to ask him, uh, <laughs> but I don't think this is a failure of intelligence. The people that were facing we the intelligence, that were, and we know that he has a breadth of knowledge. How could he? Sure, but the intelligence does not equal moral probity, or uh, uh, it doesn't mean that you're going to choose the good all the time if you're intelligent. Hold on one second. And he's a communist who believes in Marxism, Marxist internationalism, and so the prospect of a Jewish state or uh, any kind of national state is something that he's very clearly opposed to. So, um, okay. 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 okay, we can't we can't go back and forth. We just don't have time. I'm sorry, but thank you so much for those great comments. Um, Julia Lutch, Julia, are you there? Julia, um, I guess not. So, I'll, uh, first of all, I want to Robert, thank you so much for staying and answering everybody's questions into well into overtime and. This has been a, just a ter terrific presentation. Thank you so much. I hope everybody will buy his buy Robert's book and give it to all of your friends. Hi. It's an Can you hear me? Uh, oh, is this Julia? Okay, Julia, please go ahead. 
is it Julia? Julia Lutch? Okay, because it's it's just an incredible resource and, and we really have to thank you for writing this and for coming and speaking with us today. Um, we are going to have um, a meeting next, uh, or future meetings, we're going to have uh, this coming ne next Wednesday at one o'clock, same time, same place. Uh, we are going to have uh, awesome Lawrence, uh, also known as da David Lawrence, who is a Jewish boxer, uh, wrote The King of White Collar Boxing, speaking of something very different, speaking about uh, what it is to be a Jewish fighter uh, in the boxing ring. And uh, then- Hi, it's Julia Lutch. Can you hear me at all? Oh, now I can hear you. Okay, please go okay, ahead. Here's my question really quick. Palestinian violence uh, has always been something that the entire world just didn't bat an eye at. And now we have um, a lot of Muslim, Palestine, Muslim violence all over the world. And in our campuses, we find there's a lot of violence and administrators are afraid of it. So here's my question. Many Jews imagine that by supporting the Palestinians, they're being virtuous. I think they're just afraid, unless we're united, as most of the Arab Muslim supporters of the Palestinians are, we will never be able to exert any pressure to correct some of this. Yeah, and I do believe a lot of people are indeed afraid. Yes, they uh, think that if they practice a policy of appeasement, then the aggressor will stand down. That's never been the case and never will be the case, but it's pandemic nowadays, more than the coronavirus, that people think that and uh, one of the great afflictions of our age, that people assume that, uh, the, uh, that appeasement will, will work this time and bring peace. It never does, never will. That was my question regarding Biden. Okay, excuse, me, excuse me, we have to- we, Also, what about, can I just ask a question regarding transfer? What do you think of that? Who, who's this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, David Cohen, right, uh, transfer, um, transfer Palestinians, the, tra the idea of transfer. Do you think you agree? Do you think that's right? That's the last question, guys. <laughs> what was it? I'm sorry, I didn't, I, I didn't hear it all. The transfer, are you talking about population transfer? Yeah, population transfers. Yeah, transfer up all the Palestinians out of like, you know, into Jordan. Yeah, I think that that is ultimately the solution insofar as there is a solution. That uh, to have the Palestinians living in Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, wherever, whatever Arab state they want to live in that the Arab states ought to be compelled to take them in and that they ought to be induced, not forced, but induced in some way, given various uh, uh, incentives to go. Uh, there's, uh, people think this is some terrible thing. It's not. Uh, population transfers have happened all through history. Uh, I've, named, I've, I've mentioned before when the Germans lost World War II, uh, quite rightly, Germany was reduced significantly in size, and there were all sorts of Germans, millions of Germans, who lived in what is now Poland and what is now Russia. And they uh, were uh, compelled to move to, and also Czechoslovakia, and they were compelled to move to Germany. Uh, there, uh, they, if we're talking about that being justified in Germany on the basis of Germans starting an aggressive war in Europe, well, the Palestinian Arabs have started numerous aggressive wars against Israel. There's ample justification for that. And one of the, that's one of the problems of the acceptance of the principle of the Palestinian people in the first place, that the Palestinian, uh, to accept the idea that there's a Palestinian people obscures the fact that they are the same as the surrounding areas and would not have any trouble becoming able to move to those areas and uh, living normal lives there. But uh, politically, there's about zero chance of this happening at this point. Again, let me thank you again and thank everybody who's, who's here with us, everybody in our book club. We love you. We love seeing you. We love your great questions. I'm sorry if I had to cut some of you short, but uh, we try to give everybody a chance to speak. Um, and Robert, really, this was just a tremendous uh, presentation. I, I hope everybody will buy your book. Um, by the way, we, we sent out a, an email about this. I did want to mention that um, if you sign on to Amazon Smile, I think that's smile.amazon.com um, for all your Amazon purchases, including when I hope you buy Robert's book um, and, and make ZOA your, your uh, charity of choice, 0.5%, um, a half of a percent of <laughs> your, your, your anything you spend on Amazon, if you remember to sign in that way every time to smile, but Amazon Smile. 
uh, would go to ZOA. And, you know, I hope everybody will continue to support ZOA's work. We really can use contributions at this difficult time. And uh, you know, so we can have all these wonderful programs and, and work on all our work on the college campuses and everywhere. Um, Robert, thank you. I, I can't thank you enough for, for this terrific program. I hope everybody will tune in next week for an exciting program with uh, a um, Jewish boxer. Um, thank you. Take care. <laughs>